Franciscan theological language and the individuals who developed it in the 13th century can offer a direct and simple version of the New Testament principles, or it can stretch the mind and imagination, seeking to sprout and flower through diverse responses to the Holy Spirit. Many people immediately assume that while St. Francis himself had a direct unvarnished voice, it must have been a quirk of medieval clerical training which brought in daunting additions of philosophy to Franciscan spirituality. This is only half of the true picture. Francis of Assisi's earliest biographer, Thomas of Celano, wrote two versions of the founder's life story, quite different in character. Both versions wrapped up selected memories of St. Francis in an elaborate fabric of biblical images, narrative liveliness, surprising events, and powerful religious concepts. Celano's mindset was a literary one, trained in rhetoric and poetry, and preachers in a semi-literate society were often able to hold people's attention through a display of familiar learning. Prophets and great names of Christian antiquity were admired. St. Anthony of Padua was a scripture scholar and he met followers of St. Francis and joined his community preaching network. He had a similarly vigorous imaginative training to Celano and his sermons dig deeply into matching yet distinct symbolism from the Old and New Testaments. So when the Vatican Council in the 1960s asked the church's religious orders to rediscover their roots, it presented Franciscans at least with a, with a tough challenge. Uh, the phrase used was, return to your charism, which is another deceptively simple suggestion. The concept is much the same. It meant filter out whatever obstructs your core, your close appreciation of the spirit of Christ, chip off the barnacles of institutional mismanagement, the coating of abuses such as worldliness or even being hungry for power. These have prevented your Christian boats from sailing out bravely into good but neglected fishing waters. There, a harvest of new believers is wond wondering who will guide them into the nets of salvation. Now this idea could occur in a rather inward-looking version. We might say, for example, reboot your um, Christian community values. But it also could be a call to re explore how strongly the language of our particular tradition welcomes dialogue. What happens when it is used confidently amongst a new set of listeners? Either way, some version of modern spirituality had to develop. This could still respect the character of preaching as it took shape within 13th century relig religious discourse. There would be readings of revelation, yet how would they speak convincingly to modern mentalities? Any historical excavation must be done with care. But for our discoveries to offer spirituality, we must also speak with a new vitality. The word rediscover on its own is a fairly static image, like the renovator of an oil painting slowly stripping away a coat of Victorian lacquer. But if we join two words together, as in rediscover roots, the vigorous growth of a crop is implied bringing nourishment. Dynamism is essential. This fits in with how Francis and his followers used the metaphor of planting the seed of the gospel. So can we today enter into aspects of that thinking and language? We can explore Francis' relationship with Claire by comparing their different ways of proclaiming the gospel in their letters to others. Francis referred to Claire as his little plant. He possibly had in mind what St. Paul says at the opening of 1 Corinthians, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are, there's quarrelling among you, that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. There was also a fair bit of quarrelling and forming of factions amongst the followers of Francis of Assisi,
Perhaps he encouraged the thought that neither he nor Claire <coughs> had originated their modes of following Christ. What mattered was inner shared growth poured from God, the revealer of the way. Christ had brought out a harmony between the two of them. This suggested that Franciscan language could aim to keep alive ideals of equality and shared faith, while also respecting and cultivating differences and diversity. So we could call this our model one, exploring Franciscan spiritual equality. <clears throat> model, model two of this spirituality would be that Francis's companions did not huddle away from their society. They felt like the apostles from the upper room in Jerusalem. From 1209 onwards, they made daily journeys through the neighboring region as lay preachers. Their peaceful words triggered off the growth of sensitivity born afresh, even when quarrelsome umbrins were gathering together. They regarded the typical human gatherings as potential communities of worship. God helped their faith to provide deeper understanding of this. The Holy Spirit had flung open the doors. All at once their mission could offer attentiveness to what the Ho Holy Spirit was saying. Franciscan preachers learned to acquire a message of hope, compassion and reconciliation and implored people to share it. <clears throat> Planting creative communities was a process of exploring the longings of a good number of people. It also involved facilitating conversations about a change of heart amongst them, turning surely into experiences of Christ's healing presence in their midst. Lay preaching had been a new development. It was even sponsored by the clergy at times in the course of the 12th century. And the task was partly one of challenging people to ask how much time they were willing to give for living with openness to grace and loving interaction. Model three of the peculiarities of Franciscan spirituality can be described as making efforts at discernment. Members would need to agree about how well-trained community members from a local population needed to be, to be ready to voice their faith. Their search was for appropriate guidelines with which they could achieve a, a deeper integrity in conversion. So roots might need to be nourished, to be strengthened with better resources. Many believers desired opportunities to study. The right material could trigger off a breakthrough for those with that aptitude. In all three of the Synoptic Gospels, there is one text, the parable of the sower, which is located early on in hub positions, and its role is to ensure that readers absorb this criterion of resurrection faith and consider how to become good soil. This text has to stay to the fore when we explore the other parables. Francis and his followers used this parable with great commitment as highlighted at chapter 22 of the 1221 rule. This was true of the popular lay preaching of some very active and non-academic friars too, such as Blessed Giles of Assisi. Giles taught that if a man were to go straight up the Lord's road, he would not meet with fatigue or bother, but along the world's streets he meets enough weariness and boredom to kill him. <laughs> this theme also held up in the second generation when Bonaventure's commentary on Luke's Gospel expounded the multiple personality problems which are implied in that parable. In some people, he says, the seed is trodden down. In others, it is suffocated. In others, traffic along the road and a din of people causes forgetfulness. Similar concerns were important in his sermon on love's command. In Bonaventure's view of the parable about the vine dresser in Luke 13, the focus was a man who needed to be more attentive and therefore humbled himself by digging in order to achieve more fruitful living in his relationships. Three models or rules of thumb, therefore, which we might apply when comparing biographical details, scriptural passages, key incidents, awkward uh, encounters, or treasuring the records of Franciscan 
meditation, study and prayer. All of these together amount to uh, an interpretation of Franciscan spirituality. Equality as number one, lay people nurturing faith as number two, and deepening uh, perceptive integrity as number three. We should observe also that compassion was named as a valuable factor underlying each of these three standpoints as the appropriate quality for bettering self-awareness. In trying to be radical without these three elements of compassion, we would simply be rooting ourselves in a lifeless soil. So this metaphor of faith taking root so that it can spread uh, has reappeared with many implications both in modern times and in the 13th century. When the American Franciscan historian Dominic Monti <coughs> was asked to provide a reflection on the roots of Franciscan ministry, he says he hesitated. Why should any one type of ministry have the epithet Franciscan applied to it while this is denied to various alternatives, he says. St. Francis had written to Brother Leo, in whatever way it seems best to you to please the Lord God and to follow in his footsteps, do it with God's blessing. Therefore, if the Franciscan charism exists, it is always present in particular and diverse moments, love as it is lived by every follower of Francis. There will be a fraternal dimension achieved through discernment about the Spirit's grace of working, but fri friars can live together and be active in the midst of others, he says, without being part of a formal institutional structure. What counts is imitating Christ and making that experience available to others. This generates a pastoral concern to be expressed by members of a religious order in a very different way from the diocesan clergy. The community members are mobile because that will keep them free to achieve a prophetic kind of ministry as heralds of the gospel. <clears throat> Franciscans have to announce the call of God again and again in sensitive situations and in an energizing mode. They will be looking out for people who are hungering for the nourishment given by scripture. And very often, says Monty, <coughs> people are moved not by head arguments, but by gut convictions. In order to touch that deeper level and bring about true conversion, the preachers had to distribute the gospel message according to the capacity of the hearers. It would be uh, a mistake to scatter the seeds of God's call without being attentive to how receptive any specific group of listeners might be. Having a criterion of equality could mean reaching out now to di divorced and remarried Christians, for example, and others who are at odds with official church theology. The medieval version of this was often pursued through arranging for debtors to be released from prison. A third criterion of deepening integrity could exist when modifying the legal processes which enable people to end uh, a long vendetta of anger and revenge. Our second criterion, the lay initiative factor, might include allowing Catholic educational structures to promote affectivity when a warm welcome is extended to members of other faiths. Encountering people from other churches and the unbaptized. We think of Francis in dialogue with a sultan. Now, one uncomfortable advantage of studying the historical past is that it shows us early versions of our three models being attempted but then meeting with rejection or being suppressed. Peter John O'Levy wrote letters which revealed his struggle to remain at peace within himself when even friends spoke with disapproval behind his back as he argued for greater justice. Challenging harsh, harsh structures tends to leave an individual experiencing isolation. Olivi's aim, despite his abundant writings, was not to gain a great reputation. I loathed the ambitions of Paris, he said. But he had lived and taught amongst ambitious scientists, lawyers and career prelates. He explained how he needed to learn painfully to adopt lowly ways, where truth has its seat and wisdom its roots. <clears throat> 
Here the word roots applies to the effectiveness of conversion. It will be pursued under pressure, but needs to remain vigorous. O'Levy wrote near the end of the 13th century, but his, vo his view of conversion is not very different from that held by St. Bonaventure, his teacher. Faith had to be rooted in Christ in order to achieve the fruitfulness of wisdom and compassion. There will therefore be an interior journey into larger capabilities. This may begin with faith as a language of the heart, yet should also develop into varied understandings and illuminations of the mind. One modern commentator on Bonaventure talks about the normal flowering of the seed of sanctifying grace, which then brings to our nature a new uh, supernatural reality. In the writings of this early Franciscan lecturer, Grace, he says, was assigned a massive task, namely to recreate, to reform, to fill up with life, to illuminate, to assimilate, to unite, to lay the groundwork, to make acceptable, and to raise up the human soul to God. A lot, a big, a big, a big program. Grace itself can be a radical subject because it would be a mistake to examine the intended fruitfulness of a spiritual life without considering the roots, trunk and branches. Jesus' topic of, of a good soil in his parable is a commitment of the conscience to tending the growth of the whole self. Telling people that their lives are worthwhile invo involves a gut language, to quote Dominic Monti, but it may include imagination, music and drama, special gatherings to set up for counselling or as a forum for healing. Accepting lowliness, when we feel cast aside with Jacob, as Alevi puts it, should be a starting point for creativity. Grace stirs up willingness to achieve trust and empathy, a new rapport with those who feel vulnerable or confused. There are many examples of this happening in the biographical writings about the communities set up by St. Francis. Some of these remain simply consoling or charming stories for us if we do not learn the language of deeper self-discernment as developed by the original writers and their audience. There was scriptural training in exegesis among them made available by Antony of Padua. There were letters from St. Clair to sisters in Bohemia and Flanders which praised integrity and a close in relationship with Christ. There were compact but well-structured treatises on peacemaking by Guibert Tournay and on hope by Judas of Rigo. Insights into virtues and vices are indications of the beneficial effects that community and prayer have making fruitful occasions come alive. We can see versions of this in Brother Giles's saying about preparing the soul as a living room for God as he travelled from one village to the next with his condensed messages about conversion. We can see a more scholarly version of the same concern in the learned academic John of La Rochelle, who compared Greek Orthodoxy's philosophical defence of icons with an Arabic Muslim understanding of being created as God's representative, alongside relevant Catholic views of these themes. We need to be attuned to many layers of meaningful experience in those we hope to guide, help, or instruct. The encyclical Evangelii Gaudium from Pope Francis repeatedly uses this Franciscan theological topic of fruitfulness. He clearly believes that it can be the basis for beneficial interaction, tackling a, a great range of human experience in the modern world. It could, ima it could include imaginative modes of expression, and also a language of the intellect. In practice, this might take students on a long detour beyond the typical concerns of Franciscan theology, yet many detours can nevertheless be religiously valuable and constructive. They need not abandon the well-identified Franciscan areas of debate about improving qualities of mercy and peace. A key concept here for all the friars was what Francis called he who bears patiently with his neighbour in his weakness, in admonition 18. Or in his canticle, be praised my Lord through those who give pardon for your love and bear infirmity and tribulation and endure in peace. 
This prospect of fruitful faith fostering dialogue with strangers can be looked at here today without losing the thread of our topic. Specifying what we understand by the roots of compassion might take us into a huge field of contemporary uses of the phrase. And there are widespread abuses or false appeals to the word radical, of course. There are also fine independent reflections on its original religious liveliness. I want to mention just one article, since it illustrates what I mean. Cornell West was a professor of religion and also the director of the African American Studies program at Princeton in the 1990s. He investigated the topic of marginalization in several writings, including an article on the new cultural politics of difference. Here he praises the literature professor Lionel Trilling for his important initiatives in unraveling a patriarchal social consensus which was dominant in the United States. He proposed that the time had come for artists of the new cultural politics of difference to cast their nets widely and speak fruitfully as prophetic critics. Those who are aware of the complexities of ethnic diversity and migration and want to give a voice to those who are not being heard will be involved, he said, in a perennial struggle for freedom and dignity. Experiences of invisibility and namelessness caused by a patriarchal bias in terms of class privileges lead to a quest for validation and recognition. Thus language from the New Testament combines with a viewpoint in terms of solidarity between marginal groups, including women. This would be an acceptable combination to keep in mind while studying the development of Franciscan spirituality. Siding with vulnerable individuals and groups was a definite feature of St. Francis' own language concerning his vocation, as expressed in a document which Francis called his testament. We would not be wrong to apply to his friaries and hermitages Cornell West's phrases about a mode of resistance that was communal in character, for example. <coughs> like St. Francis, he welcomed the composition of poetry and songs which appeal for sensitive reconciliation in place of a power bias and which has often destroyed ordinary stable relationships. This point might make us consider the poet uh, Toni Morrison in modern times or the Canticle of the Creatures as sung by Francis' followers. The protest against abuses was beginning to be thought out vigorously in the 13th century and was soon spelt out very strikingly by Jacoponi da Todi's Franciscan songs, his poetic Lauda. On the other hand, when we try to apply statements about political ideology to the followers of Francis, some modern uh, ideological parallels are less easy to sustain. Helpfully, West also refers to an outlook which can offer something more fluid than party political structures. He speaks about great musicians and preachers who can be open to what other traditions offer while also being rooted in nourishing subcultures. An option of shunning insularity has often been contemplated by creative individuals in their pilgrimage, as he puts it. Martin Luther King is embraced alongside W.E.B. Dubois and Margaret Mead. An adequate study of how far solidarity was achieved as an effective dimension of the expansion of Franciscan song and study could surely look for the advantages of producing a subversive work of art in some situations. This might not always be radical in the modern sense of a methodical clubbing together of forces in pursuit of militant revolution, yet it did include the voices of committed lay followers of St. Francis, secular Franciscans, who refused to bear weapons in the service of feudal uh, masters, right? Uh, we might assume that back in medieval times, mendicant groups who were ready to work closely with weak members of society would easily find encouragement and training. However, even then, secular university theologians were touchy about nurturing such activities. Some of them had I suppose, independently secure prospects as chaplains for the dukes or as canon lawyers. <laughs> uh, these did not like the Pope turning them into a supervised ecclesiastical corporation. Their forceful clerical letter objecting to friars be appointed as teachers began with the words, the roots of bitterness. <laughs> 
Roots was a metaphor with several meanings, not all of them favorable towards friars. Franciscans were asked to take on roles within the existing church structures, um, to act publicly by becoming diplomats in Constantinople, in London, in Armenia, and to investigate the levels of danger present when Mongol horsemen invaded Europe. Such activities are only compassionate in a rather specialized, structured way. Uh, we, we usually mean a more closely cultivated relationship when we speak of compassion. But it is possible to see the value of integrating both levels of meaning in order to offer compassion. When television shows us thousands of vulnerable people made homeless by war, we admire the kind of response which generously provides temporary homes. But hearing of this day after day has been described as causing compassion fatigue. In other words, there is little point in trying to solve every injustice as lone individuals and even in communal groups. We need to be realistic about what assistance we can actually provide. Sensitivity to some specific longer-term fruitfulness amongst those we are able to help is a factor here. Uh, improved cultural and educational input will be significant. A community of mixed membership in the 13th century containing serfs, former lawyers, choir masters, translators and academic authors might intend to discuss justice but would realize that their complex understandings of achieving justice differed quite a lot. Julian of Spire, the choral expert, showed how Franciscan discipleship included justice by retelling stories of St. Francis and his successful foundations. Francis' companion, Giles of Assisi, from small town rural origins, told startling anecdotes while being employed as a water carrier. The Lord does not want anyone who does not acknowledge his own usefulness, uselessness, he says. <laughs> Others worked with the sick. They all wanted to live out an improved version of loving their neighbors. For some, this meant training catechists. We can detect this in David of Augsburg's Guide for Novices. For others, it was the training of preachers, as we see in John of Wales. And for academics like John of La Rochelle, or Eudes of Rigo, or Bonaventure, it meant gathering some reliable theological resources together. They searched for books about about peacemaking, relevant for classes of young adults. Often this meant uh, books providing a biblical spirituality or a spiritual language of healing, mercy and conversion. Peacemaking would require also a scholarly rooting of their lives, anchored in the good soil of Christ. Varied manifestations of fruitfulness had to spring from those same roots. It's essential to appreciate this diversity. St. Francis' character and life has been fruitful in ways he would never have suspected. He put together the first Christmas crib in Greccio and his followers wrote carols. But when we hear the King's College Choir singing a carol service on television, this may be the unforeseen fruit of his imagination. St. Francis traveled to Egypt to challenge Christian troops to back down and had a conversation with the Sultan. The modern fruit of this initiative might include Paul VI addressing the UN or the gatherings of world religious leaders in Assisi in 1986 and 2011. Francis wept loudly one time, startling his brothers and then explained to them that love himself is not loved. A few centuries later, the Stations of the Cross become a way of sharing that spiritual concern. On another occasion, he was noticed picking up pieces of paper because the name of God might be written on them. Since uh, Frederick Ozenam loved the Franciscan biographies, perhaps he saw a link with this attentiveness when he started libraries and bursaries. These were organized by the St. Vincent de Paul Society members for the semi-literate poor of France for religious reasons. Yet in all of these examples, we may feel the past is a little remote from the 21st century. So we, we have to do more than just explore some trailing branches. 
We have to think them through to imagine varieties of gospel fruitfulness which are powerful again today. We should, of course, admire moments of generosity in the biographies, such as sharing a cloak with a cripple. But the brothers and sisters of St. Francis also had larger dreams, joining a way of life that was a new Pentecost. Their fruitful activities were to come from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Shared compassion that shone from the risen Christ should turn them into pre perceptive guides. They would see with the eyes of Christ the hidden layers of non-fruitful anger and bitterness in many individuals, <coughs> and they would then speak a language of a much deeper change of heart. They appreciated the joy of forgiving buried hatred, already then such an evident presence across the world. <coughs> when Mariguen Schumacher published her translation of Sermons by St. Bonaventure, the title she chose was rooted in Christ. This is a shortened version of St. Paul's axiom about community being rooted in him, in Colossians, and grounded and rooted and grounded in love, in Ephesians. And it also draws on the uh, chapter in St. Paul's letter to the Romans where he says, you do not support the root, the root supports you. It is as members of faith and worship communities that we recognize and treasure a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We focus on Jesus of Nazareth, or on Jesus the risen Lord, or Jesus Christ ascended to sit at God's right hand, 